Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. In this video, I wanted to look at a particular issue that I found on the Quran. I want to highlight this because I think it calls into question so many other things, like the historical context in which the Quran is taking place. How do we understand certain verses that seemingly lead to absurdity? And what happens when you have improperly defined, unclear terms? Let's jump into it. Let's start off with Surah 2. Surah Al-Baqarah, Ayah 221, we read the following. And do not marry polytheistic women until they believe. And a believing slave woman is better than a polytheist, even though she might please you. And do not marry polytheistic men to your women until they believe. And a believing slave is better than a polytheist, even though he might please you. Those invite you to the fire, but Allah invites to paradise and to forgiveness by his permission. And he makes clear his verses to the people that perhaps they may remember. So it's clear here that there is a prohibition for Muslim men at the very least, or it seems for everyone, to marry a polytheistic, idol-worshipping woman. A Muslim man can't do that in Islam according to this verse. And we also get that same theological interpretation if we read the Tafsir, for example, Ibn Kathir. So that seems simple enough. This is one of the later revealed surahs in the Medina period. So it's not as if this was abrogated by anything later. And it makes it very clear, in general terms, that a Muslim man should not marry a polytheistic woman. A woman who believes in multiple gods, for example. Who bows down and worships idols of other gods, other than Allah. Okay, great. But there's a slight issue with this. Just a slight issue. If we now go to Surah al maida so Surah 5, Ayah 5, we read this. This day all good foods have been made lawful, and the food of those who were given the scripture is lawful for you, and the food is lawful for them. And lawful in marriage are chaste women from among the believers, and chaste women from among those who were given the scripture before you. Wait a second. I happen to know of a particular verse, or particular verses, that make it absolutely clear the people of the scripture are worshipping false idols. Let's jump to Surah 4, Surah Anissa, Ayat 171. O people of the scripture, that's me, do not commit excess in your religion or say about Allah except the truth. Okay, so people of the scripture are saying things that are wrong, they're going further than their religion. The Messiah, Jesus, the son of Mary, was but a messenger of Allah and his word, suspicious usage of the word, word, there, which he directed to Mary and a soul created at a command from him. So believe in Allah and his messengers, and do not say three, desist, it is better for you. Indeed, Allah is but one God. So here we see a verse where the people of the scripture are being addressed directly by Allah, and Allah is saying, look, you keep saying, look, you keep saying that Allah is three. Stop saying Allah is three or people of the scripture. That is wrong. Now you see, now we have a syllogism and we have something that makes no sense. So we have premise one, Muslim men, you're not allowed to marry polytheistic women. Nada, don't do it. Premise two, the people of the scripture are polytheists. Why? Because Allah addresses them in Surah Nisa Ayah 171 and says, oh people of the scripture, stop believing in three gods. Premise three, it's permissible for a Muslim man to marry a Christian or Jewish woman. Do you see the problem here? We now have a situation where the Quran on one hand condemns any kind of marrying polytheistic women, women who worship false idols, false gods. The Quran says that when you supposedly worship three gods, which according to the Quran is Allah, Mary and Jesus, which is wrong and in so many ways, but nonetheless, let's ignore that. Let's give the Quran the benefit of the doubt. You end up with a position where you have to say, Okay, people of the scripture are worshipping three gods. You cannot marry a polytheistic woman, but it's permissible for you to marry a woman of the book. That woman will be worshipping three gods, according to the Quran. <laughs> and what makes this worse is the Quran never specifies any kind of distinction between the correct believing people of the book and the incorrect believing people of the book. They're both still people of the book. We can find this in Surah Al-Imran. So Surah 3, Ayah... 98 and 99, where we read the following. Say, O people of the scripture, why do you disbelieve in the verses of Allah, while Allah is witness over what you do? Say, O people of the scripture, why do you avert from the way of Allah those who believe, seeking to make it seem deviant, while you are witnesses to the truth, and Allah is not unaware of what you do? So people of the book aren't just people who are correct, Quranically thinking Jews and Christians. It also includes the polytheist people of the book. It includes the people that are addressed in Surah 4, Ayah 171. People of the book, 
you're worshipping three gods. But it's okay to marry their women, because that's better somehow. What's kind of weird is that there's actually Sahih Hadith from Sahih al-Bukhari that talks about this, and it's Umar's perspective about this. Let's check out Sahih al-Bukhari 5285, where we read, Narrated Nafi, whenever Ibn Umar was asked about marrying a Christian lady or a Jewess, he would say, Allah has made it unlawful for the believers to marry ladies who ascribe partners in worship to Allah. And I do not know of a greater thing as regards to ascribing partners in worship, etc., to Allah, than that of a lady that should say that Jesus is her Lord, although he is just one of Allah's slaves. So Umar sounds pretty confused by this, because on the one hand, if he were to take the Quran holistically, he has to accept that it's permissible to marry Christians who obviously say Jesus is Lord. That's, by the way, Muslims, one of the very foundational beliefs of Christians worldwide and has always been, and yet is told that you could never marry a polytheist. Taking Jesus as an idol, supposedly, on one hand, you're permitted to do it by the Quran on the other hand, but you're also not permitted to do it by the according to the Quran because of Surah Al-Baqarah Ayah 221, which you can according to Surah Al-Maida Ayah 5. I want you to understand the absurdity of what we're dealing with here. According to the Quran, if you were to follow this and enact this, the Quran is saying, at least implicitly, that a Muslim man that ends up marrying a Christian woman, for example, that Christian woman worshipping, in the Quran's view, the Quran's view, not mine, three different gods, Allah, Mary, and Jesus, all separate gods, the Christian is worshipping three gods, creating false idols out of them, and bowing down before them, evidently committing polytheism. That, supposedly, that scenario, according to the Quran, is actually better than a Muslim man who marries a non-Muslim woman who may believe in two gods, say, Alat and Alusa. That second example, which has less idols in it, is actually worse than the first one, where the Muslim man marries someone who worships three separate gods, according to the Quran. How does that make any sense? And what's worse by this is, it calls into question exactly who are the people of the book. The people of the book is a term that is used that scholars debate exactly what groups are included in that. There are verses in the Quran that make it clear that the people of the book includes Jews and Christians. Okay, but then Sabians are mentioned. Who are Sabians? Well, that's still up for debate. Magians, okay, who are they? Well, some people think they're Zoroastrians. But if you think that's they're Zoroastrians, then do you affirm their scripture? And why would it make se any sense that Allah would be including Zoroastrians if they're not from the Abrahamic faith? What's worse is because there's no distinction between correct belief and incorrect belief, you're still a person of the scripture, if you're a Christian or a Jew or a Sabian or a Magian, then you also include every sect in those groups because they're still people of the book. So for example, at the time, you're probably going to be referring to those that believe Christ has one nature or two natures. You're going to be referring to Montanists. You're going to be referring to Ebionites. There are a ton of different heretical beliefs that are also not compatible with Islam, by the way, that are all of a sudden being affirmed as some sort of valid group in a at least partial sense, by the Qur'an. I mean, Surah Al-Maida Ayah 4 makes it clear that you can eat their food and marry their women, right? So these have practical applications in a Muslim's life, based around who you can interact with and exactly how much can you blend into their society. I mean, it's going to be a lot harder to blend into a society where you're not permitted to eat their food, for example. But if it includes false beliefs, we can include all false beliefs. So, for example, why stop there? If the Qur'an is meant to be a guide for all mankind and the final revelation, then it has to be equally applying today. So then it has to include Christian sex and Jewish sex today. So that means that you could make a case that a Mormon is part of the people of the book. I mean, evidently they take tons of false scripture. I mean, Christians wouldn't call them Christian, but they follow supposedly, according to their theology, the Torah and the Injil, at the very least. So they're people of the book if it's based on a relationship to previous scripture. And you might say, oh, okay, well, no, 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 no. The previous scripture has been corrupt, remember, right? Totally corrupted. But if the basis of who we know are the people of the book is those who believe and accept previous scriptures, if we don't have those scriptures anymore, then no one is a member of the people of the book because no one is accurately following the previous scriptures because they've been corrupted. So no one is, which means that Muslims can't share the food of anyone nor can they marry anyone outside of themselves. There are serious theological problems that arise by not being able to accurately define who is part of the, the group, the people of the book. Not only that, but there are verses in the Quran that seem to imply there may have been other scriptures that we're just not aware of. We read, for example, in Surah Al-Najm, Surah 53, Ayah 36, or has he not been informed of what was in the scriptures of Moses? Well, scriptures in the Arabic is plural, meaning 
Moses had multiple scriptures. A Muslim's going to say that's the scriptures we have today in the Torah of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. That'd be a great omission if it is. There's also mention of the scrolls of Abraham. What are the scrolls of Abraham? No idea, but supposedly that was a thing. If you're called as part of your, your deen, as part of the articles of a man to accept the previous scriptures, and you genuinely have no idea what on earth those previous scriptures are, you cannot say that you affirm them. And you cannot say that believing in the Quran as a forkan, uh, as a verifier or a criterion, because the Quran itself makes it clear that it assumes you already know things. It assumes you already know what the Ten Commandments are. It assumes you already know who the wife of Adam was. It assumes you already know who Jesus' or Isa's disciples are. It assumes you know this because it assumes you're familiar with that previous scripture. You're then commanded to accept that previous scripture. But the Quran says things that we have no idea what it's referring to. Worse yet, it may also be referring to Zoroastrian scripture, which I think is a whole new problem. So let's do a recap. Are Muslims happy with the fact that the Quran endorses a particular type of polytheism, namely marrying a Christian woman who believes, according to the Quran, Jesus, Mary, and Allah as three separate gods, and she worships them as false idols, and yet is not happy for a Muslim man to go marry a non-Muslim woman who only believes in Allah and Al-Uzza? Why is that? Is that an issue? To me, it seems quite clear that it is. The Quran doesn't seem to understand what people actually believe. It doesn't seem to understand the historical context that these things are taking place in. The overwhelming majority of the entire world of Christians, or all of Christendom, at this point believes in the Nicene Creed as a minimum, which acknowledges that Jesus died, was resurrected, that he is the son of God, and that he will come back to judge. These doctrines are pretty problematic for Muslims. And yet the majority of Christians at Muhammad's time believe this. Muhammad seemed to not understand this or not to be aware of what was happening, despite the fact that according to the standard Islamic narrative, Muhammad was chilling in Ethiopia, which was a part of the Coptic Orthodox Church. He was chilling, at least with some Christians in Najran, which is a part of North Yemen, which again, we know were mere Fizites. These were people that hold to a particular Christological position, which is a particular understanding of the Trinity. How on earth did Muhammad not understand that Christians believe in the Triune God? He didn't understand this, I think because he was never really there. Whoever the Muhammad was, he wasn't the person that the Quran says he is. That seems to be totally factually incorrect. But anyway, I'm going to end the video there. God bless you all. I hope you have a, a great day. Come to the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't have these issues. We understand that doctrine. Without these kind of unclear, ambiguous, very Sharia-changing verses, we know who our Lord is. We love all Muslims, but we hate false doctrine. So come to a path that is clearer, come to a path that despises idolatry and polytheism and isn't confused about it. Come to a God that loves you, who knew you from before you were born, and that is our Lord Jesus Christ. God bless you all. Have a great day.